Hello, my name is Asha Kaushal. I'm an assistant professor at the UBC Allard School of Law here, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone um, to this celebration and launch of the book Revolutionary Feminisms, edited by Brenna Bandar and Rafif Ziada. I wanted to start our time together, as we always do, by acknowledging that even if COVID-19 puts us all in disparate time zones, that we're virtually gathered now and today on the um, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Revolutionary Feminisms is a compilation of interviews organized around three categories of conversation and thoughts. Uh, the first is diaspora migration empire. The second is colonialism, capitalism, resistance. And the third is abolition feminism. Hewing to these categories, which is an appropriate legal way to proceed. We have the two editors here with us today, as well as one contributor from each of those conversations, all of whom I'll introduce in just a moment. First, I wanted to talk about our plan for uh, our time together today. After I introduce the co-sponsors for this virtual book launch and our guests, I'll turn over to Brenna and Rafif to talk about the origin and aims of their book, and then from there, I'll ask a series of questions, three in total, and offer the editors and the contributors a chance to speak to those questions. We'll do this in three rounds, and with any time remaining, we'll open up to audience questions. So before I introduce this group of wonderful scholars and activists, let me thank our co-sponsors. A book is written at least in part to be read, and these centers, institutes, and chairs join us in trying to amplify this important collection. From the UBC campus, we have the Center for Feminist Legal Studies, Indigenous Legal Studies, and the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. And from the University of Ottawa, we have the Shirley Greenberg Chair for Women and the Legal Profession, currently held by Natasha Bacht. Now, we have five very accomplished individuals here with us today, and many of you are familiar with their work. So I have decided to simply mention one of their institutional homes and then to provide one other portal into their work. So let me start with the editors. Brenna Bandar is reader in law and critical theory at SOAS and soon to be faculty member here at Allard Law starting in January, 2021. She is the author of The Colonial Lives of Property. Rafif Ziada is lecturer in politics at SOAS. In addition to her scholarly work on the comparative politics of the Middle East, she is also a poet with a new spoken word album called Three Generations. And now to the contributors and interviewees. Aftar Bra is Professor Emerita at Birkbeck, University of College London and a founding member of South Hall Black Sisters, the activist group of Black and Asian women working for women's human rights in the UK. Avery Gordon is professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and currently a visiting professor at Birkbeck, if I'm not mistaken. She is the former keeper of the Hawthorne Archive, which I will describe or try to describe as a space for political consciousness beyond mere resistance. And Leanne Bedasamose Simpson is a scholar, activist, artist, and author. She teaches at the Dechinta Center on Yellowknife Dene territory and has a brand new book, Nupaming, The Cure for White Ladies. So with these small glimpses into the work of these five, let me hand over to Brenna and Rafif. Uh, thank you so much, Asha, for that um, warm welcome and introduction. Um, before I carry on, I end that um, uh, that with with respect, I'm on the land of the Lekwungen First Nation, and that this is unceded territory of these Coast Salish people, uh, whose historic relationships to the land continue to this day. Uh, and I, I wanted to do that acknowledgement because I'm actually situated in, in Victoria at the moment. Um, so to continue with, with the uh, other acknowledgements, uh, thank you very much to uh, Deborah Parks and uh, Chelsea for 
all of the um, labor involved in organizing this virtual launch. And thank you very much to the other co-sponsors as well. Um, so I'm just going to speak for five, seven minutes or so about the project. Um, um, now, I guess to answer the question of why we did this project, why we took it on, um, increasingly, Rafif and I, uh, I think it's safe to speak for her uh, for a moment, uh, uh, we had the feeling that with the mainstreaming of the discourse of intersectionality, uh, that the rich and varied histories of this concept were not necessarily present in uh, much of the discussion that we were um, listening to. And there are, are many possible reasons for this. Uh, one might be that as intersectionality has gained greater prominence as an idea, its power and radicality uh, has dimmed uh, by virtue of its appropriation by the mainstream. Um, it could also be that the ways in which people obtain information uh, these days uh, means that there can be a tendency to not really research things chronologically um, or even particularly um, deeply uh, uh, in some ways. Um, uh, or, or indeed with much reflection on the conditions in which ideas and concepts like intersectionality, just to use that as one example, uh, the conditions uh, under which these concepts and ideas emerge. Um, so this project originally was about filling in some of these gaps. Um, and, and indeed, as we can see over the past several years, there, there has been a slew of books uh, published as well as older texts republish that seek to shed light on a wider and more varied archive of feminist thinking and activism that is anti-racist and anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist. Uh, just to name a few examples, uh, Kiyanga Yamata Taylor's book, How We Get Free, Black Feminism and the Combahee River Collective, uh, marked the 40th anniversary of the CRC's founding statement uh, and also interestingly took the form, uh, at least in part, uh, uh, as an interview book. Um, new work on the life and politics of uh, Claudia Jones has emerged recently. Uh, the republication of The Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain by Beverly Bryan, Stella Dazzi, and Suzanne Scaife was another, which was another germinal text when it was first published. Uh, uh, was recently republished by Verso. And another new text, uh, Lola Olufemi's uh, fantastic book, uh, Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, which was also published uh, earlier this year, uh, among, among many other texts about uh, revolutionary feminisms have appeared. And I think that these books collectively speak to a real thirst for these ideas and these political histories uh, which really are the, uh, to quote from Angela Davis, the unfinished activisms uh, that she speaks of um, and, and which we refer to in, a, in the introduction to this book and which Lisa Lowe also discusses in her afterward. So I think this book um, became, uh, in the end, a, a, a book that's situated within this genre of feminist text and uh, what we are hoping to do is to contribute to this conversation. Now, in terms of themes that I wanted to highlight in advance of the conversation that we're going to have today, um, I suppose so much has happened in the months between finishing the book and, and its publication and, and, and this moment now. So, um, uh, a global movement for Black Lives has reemerged with renewed vigor. Um, the global pandemic has laid bare a massive global crisis in care work and production. Huge rise of the far right, again, globally, uh, with all of the racism and xenophobia and sexism and transphobia and crucially climate change denial has brought with it a deep sense of despair, I think is, is fair to say. Um, so I'm interested in how we hold different antagonisms and different contradictions together. So how do we 
think and act with these very different, the, the, these series of different antagonisms that, that we are experiencing at this conjuncture. So on the one hand, we have thousands of people taking to the streets to demand economic and racial justice, uh, while at the same time, uh, governments in the UK, the US, India, Brazil, and elsewhere that saw massive protests um, have, uh, under the cover of COVID-19, uh, sought to further entrench their power, and specifically forms of accumulation by dispossession, whereby private corporations wreak massive profits on the back of uh, citizens. Now, you'll notice that I'm not referring to Canada very much because I've just uh, landed back here and uh, I, I uh, am what's going to take a bit of time, I think, to uh, um, become reacquainted with things. Um, in this current moment, we are seeing huge windfalls for the corporations that have been awarded con contracts. Here I'm thinking about the UK in particular, uh, that have been awarded contracts for testing and tracing, uh, for the provision of other health-related care services, uh, uh, for all of the online platforms and software products that businesses, including universities, and in the UK, universities now are, I think, unequivocally conceived of as businesses. Um, so all of these products that, that businesses need to shift online, to name a few examples, uh, show and expose this uh, um, uh, compli not complicity, but this, this very intimate relationship between uh, state and corporation. Now, how do we think about the months of ongoing protests and resistance alongside all of the racialized and gendered implications of handing over control to corporations when it comes to the provision of social goods, such as education and healthcare? Uh, we know that COVID disproportionately affects racialized and economically marginalized uh, or, or working class communities in the UK and the US, and I suspect the case is the same here in Canada, um, as well as a result of, uh, as a result of well entrenched disparities that affect people's health and immune systems. Um, at this particular juncture, some of the themes that we cover in the interviews, I think provide a lot of intellectual and political resources for thinking through multiple and intersecting forms of power, but not in a way that is disconnected from thinking about structurally embedded forms of oppression. And there's a tension with all of the feminist engagements, I think, uh, with, with, Mar with Marxist and Marxian uh, uh, frames of analysis that runs throughout the book. Um, now, most particularly, many, if not most people interviewed in the book have engaged the state and the question of what the state is in this neoliberal era, where the state and private corporations are so hybridized, as I was speaking about a moment ago, so as to have produced a different form of governance altogether. Where is the locus of accountability when it comes to the exercise of power in this pandemic moment? How do we work and think about the pandemic, the crisis in care, climate change, along multiple and intersecting registers, the political economic, the cultural, the psychoanalytic, the juridical. The work of Avtar, Avery, and Leanne, uh, along with the other interviewees in the book, have much to tell us when it comes to trying to grapple with these antagonisms. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we'll have today, so thanks. Rafif, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, thank you, Asha, for the very kind introduction. And thank you so much to Avery, Afsar, and Leanne for being here and for all the time you gave to the project. Um, thanks to all the sponsoring organizations. I wanted to just speak very briefly because I'm very keen for us to start the conversation with everybody. Um, I just wanted to mention the format of the book. Um, why we decided to go with an interviews book rather than Brenna and I just writing ourselves our reflections. Um, and this actually took us quite a bit of time to decide on. And finally, we thought 
out of the feminist praxis that we believe in and that we're writing about for this book, it made a lot more sense to actually do it as a collaborative project. We are very much, much pushed in academia to always think that our ideas are just original to us. They originate just within our mind, not in community and not with others. Um, and that they are just of the moment. And so we really wanted to push against the grain with this book and say that actually work can be produced that's quite in it, in innovative when it's with community, in community, and also for community. So um, we interviewed people whose thought and praxis and activism has really shaped um, the ways we think and the ways we do our own activism. Um, it was a, a pleasure to work in this way. Um, not to be thinking of it um, in these competitive terms of ownership of ideas that we are pushed to think about, but rather to think of how do we create something. This format also really allowed us to ask people how their ideas have changed since they wrote about them. Um, just to mention some of the other interviewees uh, in the book, uh, it's also Himani Banerjee, Angela Davis, Sylvia Federici, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, Gail Lewis um, and Ron Ware. So it gave us the opportunity as we do these interviews to really ask them to reflect on when the ideas were written, but also how they have changed through time, allowing for that conversation of change. Um, and also allowing for us to question and debate together. Um, I wish all uh, writing projects were like this. Um, I also wish all partners in writing projects are like Brenna because it was a pleasure to go through and do this book in this way. Um, and, I, and I wish in universities we were uh, more uh, inclined to do collective work rather than always be pushed to do individualistic competitive work. Having said that, uh, the book really deals with um, an explicit type of feminism, one that is anti-racist, but also anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist. It's very much grounded um, in anti-capitalism and anti-racism and, and the intersections between that um, that have been intrinsic to the writing of mo all of the people that we interviewed. It was very shocking to me, um, having been the survivor of one settler colony, Israel, moving to yet another settler colony, Canada, to then arrive um, in England and realize that there's complete oblivion to the legacies of empire. Um, that there has been no reckoning really with the history of empire and its continued legacies in places like Canada or places like Palestine. So it was really important um, to think through these ideas of internationalism, how they emerge, um, how anti-imperialism was conceived of. And it was really interesting in all the interviews that people's own personal stories showed the interconnection of geography around how racial thinking and capitalism function on international scale. I think in the interview with Avatar in particular, um, she talks about how although migrants were in the UK, they very much understood themselves to be part of former colonies and those histories of struggles um, those longer histories of colonialism did not vanish and became in a new place or became a resident or a citizen of a new location. So it was very uh, explicit throughout the book, the discussions both around anti-imperialism, anti-capitalism and solidarity, which is I think now something everyone is thinking through when it comes to Black Lives Matter or uh, boycotts, divestments and sanctions when it comes to Palestine climate change is how do we build alliances and solidarities that are respectful um, and long-term that acknowledge differences, but also allow us to build together for a better future. So just to end on the current moment, um, we had no idea the book would come out uh, during a global pandemic. Um, it came out within a few weeks of lockdown um, the, the pressure of moving to teach online within a few weeks was really upon us. And you really saw how the corporations were, were managing to act quite quickly to seize the moment. But COVID also laid bare uh, 
what an essential worker means, who keeps the economy going, the racialized labor, migration systems and how they function, and also the global system of economic apartheid. So the book really comes out at a moment where we're all thinking through how do we change and how do we enact change from this moment that we find ourselves in. And its importance um, is in these conversations and, and laying out past forms of resistance, past organizing, because we discuss quite a lot of organizing campaigns throughout the book, um, how they manifested, how people built them, um, how they succeeded, but also how they failed. And this is important for us because again, we're very pushed today to always think of the moment, in the moment with a, with a kind of urgency, which is sometimes good um, what, to feel that urgency, but we're also not historyless, we're not her storyless. Um, there's an entire archive um, and there are entire ancestors that who, on whose shoulders we stand who have given us repertoires of resistance, various forms of resistance to learn from not to romanticize the past, uh, but to learn from it, to be able to assess the current moment. And I hope uh, this conversation will help us go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so let me begin with uh, my first question to you. Uh, and it is about the idea of place. Avery, we'll start with you this time and uh, next time with Avtar and with the third question with Leanne. So um, I think that Brenna and Rafif have, have um, provided the introduction to their book, so I won't talk more about that. I wanted to start off our conversation today talking about the journey from the place where each of you began to the place where each of you is now. And I wanted to do that to convey a sense of how your place informs your feminism. There's something very personal in each of these interviews that is generative, as Leanne might say, of the shape of your academic work and your activisms. Now in the geographical sense of the word, and Rafif touched on this, um, place is often thought about as a location where space meets identity. Space, of course, is not neutral or pre-existing, but rather a site of power and contestation. And the same might be said about identity. Now in somewhat obvious ways, you're each now working from a different geographical location. Um, Avtar is in Britain, Leanne is in Canada, Avery is in the United States. But you also talk in your interviews about the places you grew up and how those places, with their specific configurations of state violence, formed you and your intellectual orientation. I'm thinking here about relationships between contexts of colonialism and independence, about the Indian Act, residential schools and reconciliation, and about Jim Crow and civil rights, that dynamic of reform and retrenchment, and how coming of age amidst those experiences shaped your sense of place. So I'm hoping you can talk to us about how this sense of place has mattered for your own work. Your concepts of diaspora, Avtar, generative refusal, Leanne, and abolition feminism, Avery, seem deeply rooted in both the past and the future. So do these roots produce a particular set of solidarities or commitments? Avery, I'll turn over to you. I'll mute myself first, yeah, thanks. First of all, let me say how very pleased I am to be included in this wonderful book and to be here with all of you today. So thank you, Brenna and Rafi, for making it. Um, okay, I am gonna just answer this question a bit literally um, in terms of like where I, my, my, I started, where my, my growing up. I was born in the Jim Crow Southern United States in the 1950s to an extended lower middle class family of avowed racists and a natal family of parents who were ill-equipped to raise children. If you could imagine the complete negation of what Leanne has described in her interview as Nishnabeg understandings of children and the adult relations with them, she talks about that in the beginning of her interview, it would be that. Violent, possessive, authoritarian. 
And so the alienation from that world in the country, its view of things, its political positions and so on was pretty complete um, for me at a young age. And in many ways, complete alienation was a means of survival. I'm grateful for it, um, even if it came at a certain cost. So that experience literally of my, my childhood, my upbringing, um, has clearly influenced who I am as a person and also the intellectual work that I've done in three ways that I think are worth mentioning. And so the first one is that I really grew up experiencing racism as intolerable, as a first order problem, if you write really like a kind of skin that just couldn't be avoided or subordinated to other issues. Very, very present to grow up in the South like that. I mean, could say it more academically, that experience forced me to understand racism as constitutive of, to use Cedric Robbins' phrase, the terms of, of order, and therefore to make exposing it, abolishing it a, a priority. Um, you can put it in more formal or academic language, but it was very, very personal for me. And to some extent, you know, sometimes I think, well, if I'd had a more caring family, I might have been more loyal to its way of life, more torn about where and with whom um, my fate and the fate of those I cared about could be trusted, but that was not the case. And so from a very young age, in many ways, I had to find other ways of doing family, of doing kinship, community, friendship, commitment, solidarity, and I have continued to look for those other ways and to try to promote them through teaching, writing, and political organizing. So that was one influence of my background. The second one was that the place where I grew up was the place that I ran away from. And I ran away often as a girl. And then at 16, when I left home for good, I also, of course, ran away imaginatively into places and spaces that were better, more inviting, as I found them with others and also in books and music and so on. Um, I have been living between countries uh, for a long time now, not quite belonging in the one where I hold citizenship or belonging in the other one where I, where I do not. Why is this important? Well, running away, being able to let go effectively, of the, the psychic and the social investments in what's killing you, being or becoming what the writer Tony K. Bambara calls unavailable for servitude, being able to live in what I like to call indifference, indifference to the violence and also indifference to all the, to the lures, to what's offered as the good life. These have been very important to to what I've written about and to, in general, how I understand political struggle um, and what's at stake in what we're struggling for and not just against. Um, and the third major influence of the place where I grew up is that it led me in an odd way, counterintuitively in a way, to an internationalist politics and to a concern exactly with that capitalist world system and to what Lisa Lowe has called the international division of humanity. And in the first instance, of course, because the map is always a key tool for the runaway, especially one who grew up in a very provincial environment like I did and was so always looking to get away, the further, the better. I mean, I was always looking for what was out there. In that. And an undergraduate student at Georgetown University, I studied with the distinguished Palestinian historian and philosopher Hisham Sharabi, and he um, introduced me to something I had had no contact with, which was the really vibrant U.S. and of radical anti-capitalist and anti-colonialism. I had come up very much in the context of the civil rights and black power movement, and that set me on my intellectual and political path. And I sort of stayed on that path and, you know, carry those experiences, those themes with me as I've moved around, hopefully getting more wisdom as I've gotten older through studies and, and encounters with, with people in, in new situations.
Avtar, Leanne, did you want to jump in? Yes, I'll jump in. Um, well, uh, I have actually been diasporic for a very long time. I was born in India, but I grew up in Uganda. And uh, I grew up when Uganda was still a colony. And so my first encounters with sort of colonial relations occurred in Uganda itself. And then as a student from Uganda, I went to California. So I was an undergraduate in California. And I was at the time studying soil science, believe it or not. I was not a sociologist at the time. And uh, so there was a shift from thinking about what I used to call a colonial sandwich situation in Uganda with white Europeans at the top, Asians in the middle, and black Africans at the bottom. So that was the kind of sandwich that we had, the sort of context in which social relations took place. Whereas in the US, obviously I was a student. So as a student, it was a slightly protective environment at the time. And uh, I became much more aware in, 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 in the racialized sense about the difference between the ways in which people like me with the slightly lighter skin color were treated and people who were African-Americans. So I was kind of introduced to a slightly different context in which different shades of skin color meant something different, although similar to Uganda, but quite different as well. And I became uh, I, egalitarian politics have always been attractive to me. Even as a young child, I used to read novels in my mother tongue, which is Punjabi, uh, you know, which were quite not socialist. I wouldn't have used that term socialism to describe them, but they were very egalitarian. And uh, while I was in California, I began to sort of start thinking more about egalitarian relationships and the ways in which different people were positioned uh, within the class hierarchy um, in different contexts. And then uh, I came to Britain on my way back to Uganda, actually. Once I finished my studies in uh, California, I was also in Wisconsin, actually. I did my master's in Wisconsin. So when I came to Britain to visit my brother who was living here, and I was on my way back to Uganda. And that was when Idi Amin, I don't know how many of you would remember that, but Idi Amin was the president of Uganda at the time. And he decided to expel all Asians, uh, who were mostly South Asians actually, from Uganda. And this was in 1972. And uh, so, which meant that I could not, even though I was a Uganda citizen, I couldn't go back to Uganda. I ended up staying in Britain. And then I had to, I became a refugee in Britain and I was a refugee for five years. Uh, it also meant that I suddenly had to find my feet in a completely new context where I hadn't actually uh, planned to live at all. Um, and gradually I started working as a research assistant in a university and then I, registered for a PhD and kind of ended up in academia. But what, was, what struck me quite strongly was the fact that although I had been racialized in USA, in Britain, it was very different. Um, I had to experience an othering process, which was through the lens of this relation, colonial relationship between Uganda and between Britain. I also became much more attuned to class politics, although class politics are everywhere, but there is a sense in which class politics are much more explicit, explicitly acknowledged in Britain than they are in some other countries. And so class politics was very much on my, they came on my agenda. And I began to think much more critically about class relations and became what I then started to describe myself as a socialist. 
So socialist and feminist, I have always been. I must say that from my childhood, I was very conscious of the position of women in society, although of course not using such grand language at the time. But I knew when I was, again, when I was a child or a, and a teenager, I used to study Punjabi literature. And one of my favorite novelists was uh, an author called Nanak Singh. And he wrote novels, which actually, he, although he was a man, he actually took on the whole patriarchal society of Punjab um, as, a, as something to critique. And that influenced me enormously. So that by the time I came to Britain, I was into those kinds of ideas already. But when I was in Britain, I became involved in, directly involved in feminist politics. And I became, when I was in Bristol, when I was doing my PhD, um, I started getting um, involved in um, feminist politics much more directly through groups. Uh, we, we, as, a, as a group of women, we got together and started to have conscious raising, what used to be then called conscious raising uh, meetings. And then I moved to London. And when I moved to London, I became involved in black feminist politics. And this was partly because at the time uh, with white, I mean, at the time we actually talked about white feminism and black feminism because there was, a, 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 there were ways in which questions of racism were not taken on board so explicitly within white feminism at the time. So that those of us who were black and here, when I say black, I mean, Asians and African Caribbean descent people, or women particularly in this case, um, we decided to use the term black uh, in order to efface colorism, basically, you know, so that the lighter skinned you are, the better uh, you're positioned in society. And, uh, and I, that's when, that is when I was also working for a period I couldn't find a job and I was unemployed and then I found a job as a community worker and I was living in South Hall which is a, uh, a very predominantly South Asian or at least at, at the time was a South Asian population place and, uh, and that was there I met other women African Caribbean women Asian women and we decided to form South Hall Black Sisters as a feminist organization. And I've been involved with that all this time. Although, of course, now, um, because I don't live in South Hall itself, I'm not that directly kind of, you know, um, involved in their everyday politics, but uh, emotionally and psychologically and politically very much um, associated with that. Um, I think I'll stop at the moment and then uh, um, come back later. Ani Kinawaya, um, I'm so happy to be here um, and in conversation with all of you and in conversation with all of the uh, amazing thinkers in this book. Um, my understanding of place is relational. It's one of deep reciprocity and consent and diversity and a respect for individual self-determination and the communal. Um, it's one in which I have a relationship with plants and trees and animal nations and land and water and air. It's one that I have a relationship with my ancestors who have, have passed onto, onto the spirit world and also those that have yet to be born. It exists across time and, and space. And so I think for me, I understand place not as a noun and not as something that is fixed, but as a verb. It's something that is continually made through complex and deep relationships of, of reciprocity. Place to me is a world making exercise or world making practice. So I think of place is a practice in place as a practice. I think of my body as a hub 
in a networked system of relationships. I think that in that way, place to me is something that's very, very intimate. It involves my emotions, it involves my body, it involves my like physical body, my intellect, my spirituality. It's very, very, very local um, because I'm in conversation and I'm in making life with all of these other forms of life um, continually. And, and it's something that's always in flux because there's a different amount of light at each point in the day. There's a different amount of heat. There's, just, there's different seasons. There's all kinds of beautiful, um, diverse ways of, of being and interacting. So it's very, very local, but it's also international in scope because um, I think one of the things that my people have learned about deep relationality is that everything that makes up this world, everything that makes up this cosmos is, is affecting and impacting and influencing each other. And so I think oftentimes we think of indigenous knowledge and indigenous people and indigenous feminisms as something that is very local and very place-based and therefore exclusive. But I think it's actually very, very expansive because of that ethic of thinking through um, with an international um, theater of actors. Um, and that includes humans and plants and animals and all of the, the wonderful forces and energy that make up, that make up the worlds that we make. So it's a, a very complex relationality that then gives birth to ways of thinking and ways of knowing um, and languages that are designed to communicate and to connect, to create a sense of, of belongings. Um, and that's a very different way of, I think, of, of, of coming to knowledge, of generating knowledge than, than Western systems. And so at the beginning of my, my journey, I would say 20 years ago, I moved back home to my territory. I, I quit a tenure track position and I've, I sort of put that Anishinaabe um, worldview, that Anishinaabe learning at the center of my life. Um, and, and worked with a number of elders over a number of years to learn how to, to think um, within that reality, to learn how to world make. And at first I was very, very focused on that because it's something that you can't learn through books, you can't learn at university. Um, colonialism, capitalism, heteropatriarchy has really shattered that, that system. So learning in that way, learning in a place-based way is something that's very, um, that's a struggle. And after doing it for, for two decades, I'm now so interested in that internationalist component out of bringing this thinking, indigenous, indigenous thought, um, Anishinaabe thought in conversation with other anti-colonial and liberatory um, thought processes and peoples of the world, because I think that then becomes um, a very generative for me, for me point. So I feel very grateful. I've always read really, really widely, and I've always, um, I've always tried to to embody that ethic of of not just staying local, but also using that as a as a root to expand out. And now I, I feel like I'm very appreciative of forums like this where um, can start to have conversations, think through together um, with the idea of, of building something different, of refusing capitalism, of refusing white supremacy, of refusing imperialism, of refusing all of these big structures that have got us to where we are and thinking through how to share land, how to share space, how to build uh, home spaces that bring out uh, the very, very best parts of us as individuals and us as, as formations and, and us as communities. And so I think um, in thinking through space as sort of that, that spot where, where space meets identity, 
the idea of power um, also comes into play. And so I was trying to think through how power is thought of uh, within Anishinaabe thought. And within this relational part, I think that individuals are really encouraged to, to be their best selves. They're encouraged to give back. They're encouraged to engage in an ethic of, of caring and an ethic of sharing, an ethic of generosity um, with, with labor, with thought, with material possessions. So that idea of, of place is one that is, you could say continually violated, but it's one that's continually formed with all of these different um, sets of relationships that are coming into contact with each other. And so it becomes this um, really beautiful space that exists in the spiritual world and it also exists in the physical world. And I think that one of the, the, the ways that we look at people who are powerful in our communities are people who are embodying these ethics, um, who are able to give back in, in enormous generative ways, who are so generous, but are also able to maintain their own sense of self and their own mental health and their own, their own, uh, they're able to keep their shit together while they're doing all this giving. Um, and they end up being, being the folks that I think we look to as leaders and we look to as, as power rather than this idea of, of authoritarian power or power over, which if you have a system that really values life and if you have this division between living and non-living things rather than human and non-human things, then this idea of caretaking, this idea of sharing, this idea of power being something that comes from, from the ground up in a spiritual sense, I think, becomes uh, something that's uh, foundational to how one views space. So, thank you. <laughs> Brenna or Rafif, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, so let me move on to our second question then. Um, and this time I'd like to focus on your intellectual work, uh, which is both clarifying and complicated and very hard to do justice to, but let me try to do this in two, or two minutes or less. Um, and I'm hoping to do that through the tried and true approach of thinking about what your intellectual work is not. So Avtar, you've made several interventions into identity politics and post-colonialism including through your diasporic as method method, uh, focusing on the relationships between imperialism and racism. Leanne, you have resisted the notion that freedom for indigenous nations looks like the Westphalian nation state and that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission with its focus on the individual and its failure to alter the structure of the colonial relationship represents anything like the kind of relational grounded freedom that is required. And Avery, you suggest that the task is not simply to illuminate what is repressed and excluded by a given social order, but to side with the repressed and excluded. And you've written about that by working over the categorical boundaries and potential solidarities of race, class, and gender. And none of that can be boiled down to bringing in race or class or capitalism. They penetrate far deeper, insisting on the interlocking nature of the forces and focusing on political subjectivities. You provide methods, diasporic, relational, generative, haunting, utopian, intended for particular contexts, but which we can extrapolate to others. And so I wanna ask you today about that work and those methods and their relationship to other strands of feminism. In this largely Canadian legal audience, um, perhaps not entirely, I would venture that there's more familiarity with uh, what Brenna already mentioned, critical race theory, intersectionality, um, and to some extent, post-colonialism. And so I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about situating your commitments and frameworks in a broader intellectual context and talk to us about the shared axes of solidarity and the sticking points. So this time, Avtar, uh, we'll start with you, please. Okay, thank you. Um... Well, um, intellectually, and my, for me, intellectually, things have always been connected with politics, you know. So 
the work that you do in the university is also connected with the sorts of things that you do on the ground. And for me, feminism was a lifeline, um, both intellectually and politically. And uh, so my work, as you asked, has actually developed in conversation with what today we call intersectionality, although, as I'll say in a minute, I used the term politics of location when I was first thinking about it. And as you will all know that politics of location is kind of a precursor. And uh, people like Chandra Mohanty um, talked about politics of location in her work. And I was influenced by that. Over the years, my own work has developed along um, questions of diaspora. and. Uh, I talk in my work about diaspora space, which I describe as an articulation between diaspora as a concept and borders, borders across nations, between people, across people, as well as politics of uh, location. So diaspora space is kind of a, place of confluence where these three axes come together. And I am concerned about all the different borders that try to separate us, but also borders that we struggle against and we overcome. And diaspora for me is about dispersal, but it's about genealogies of dis dispersal that specify the economic, political, and cultural dimensions of people's everyday lives. So it's not something abstract, it's very real in, in that sense, that diaspora space is about uh, economic, political, and cultural differentiations and sociologies and social life. Um, it's about so social conditions, underpinning the specificity of a particular diaspora. Diasporas, of course, are many and varied. They are not just one homogeneous category. Um, there have been diasporas which have been uh, in terms of um, histories of slavery, histories of migration, and therefore diasporas are uh, across multiple kind of, you know, conditionalities. and. Uh, um, for me, in terms of both diaspora but also feminism, these questions bring together the ways in which dispersals and solidarities come together. I like the way in which uh, uh, Leanne uh, spoke about relationality. It's very much about relationality. Relationality across different borders. Uh, relationality across different subjectivities. At the heart of, when I talk about diaspora, at the heart of it is the notion of uh, uh, commonality. It's, it's, it's at the no notion of difference. And I think of difference across four axes. Difference in terms of social relations, as we talk about in sociology, social relations. But difference also understood in terms of experience, difference understood in terms of um, subjectivity, and difference understood in, in terms of the ways in which these three axes come together. So for me, questions about difference, questions about are the other side of the difference is solidarity. And it's very much about how we construct solidarities uh, in this very, very divided world. You know, I mean, you've got an election coming up in the USA soon, and we have kind of a situation where we have people like Trump who might still get in for another, uh, you know, four or five years. Um, so questions about uh, solidarity are very essential and central to me. 
Thank you, Abby. Leanne or Avery, which one of you wanted to go next? I guess I got my mute button off first. <laughs> um, well, I think picking up on, on the discussion um, from the last from my, from my last answer, I think that this idea of, of thinking through together is really, really important in terms of figuring out how to share time and space and build worlds uh, that refuse capitalism and that refuse heteropatriarchy. Um, I think that for me, I've been really, really lucky to be part of a generation of Indigenous scholars that for the first time ever at the university and in institutions have colleagues. And so I've been really appreciative of the work of Audra Simpson and also of Glenn Cothard um, because they're making interventions, theoretical interventions into uh, bodies of knowledge that I, I have familiarity with, but I'm not, um, that I'm not an expert in. And so I like, I feel grateful to have had the opportunity to sort of think in formation with those, those two scholars and many others, um, indigenous feminists like Sarah Hunt. In, um, in Red Skin White Mass, Glenn makes this important intervention into Marxism around land um, and colonialism and talks about how this indigenous experience of colonialism ha is one that's rooted in the theft of land and the usurpation of indigenous political authority. Um, and he talks a lot about dispossession as this ongoing physical feature of colonialism. Um, he uses the term grounded normativity quite a lot, which I think in some ways could be a shorthand code for almost all of my body of work. Um, and so in my book, as we have always done, I wanted to use that intervention that Glenn had made to talk about dispossession, not just in terms of land and the usurpation of, of our political authority, but in a more expansive way, in a more structural way, um, based on some of the interventions that Sarah Hunt had made around um, this false dichotomy between land and bodies. And so within Anishinaabe thought, this idea that um, I'm in a deep uh, reciprocal relationship with the land, that my body is in a deep reciprocal relationship of the land means that I haven't just been dispossessed of my land, I've also been dispossessed of my body, of my spirit, of my, my intellect, of my language. And, and this has been expansive and it's been a violent process. And it is an ongoing violent process um, where today the violence is, is asymmetric and is focused on two-spirit, queer, trans, indigenous people and women. And so I think that's, um, that was an important thing for me to write about. And that was an important thing for me to think through. Um, and I think uh, it was an important intervention for, for, for Glenn to make as well. And then I think in, in As We Have Always Done, I was able to take this idea of, these ideas of refusal, um, these ideas of body and land, the ideas of um, making refusal uh, generative, and sort of deepen my understanding through thinking through these issues and these interventions from within, from within Anishinaabe thought. So I really think that I really, really like um, thinking <laughs> and I really, really like to be able to engage in these kinds of, of conversations because as we all know, it's not enough to just critique the system. We have to build the alternative in real time uh, and in spite of all odds, in spite of global uh, catastrophes and crises and every time we engage in that making process, I think that we learn and we unlock bodies of knowledge and ways of thinking that help us the next time that we, we uh, engage in that, in that creation process. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I actually find this sort of a difficult question to answer in a short way like, like this, but um, 
a good deal of a, most of a good deal of my work, I would say, is very much taken up with the problem of um, of how to represent, um, or in, and in particular, how to write about these um, complex modern systems of power that we have names for colonialism, capitalism, so on. Um, how to write about those while at the same time also writing about the emergence and development of political consciousness and forms of change and movement. A little bit about when Brenda, you talked in the beginning about holding antagonism together. Um, very much trying to do that, but um, to break out of some of the mechanical ways that we're taught to do that as, as scholars and um, to try to, to, um, to find a more, if you like, creative and maybe also um, evocative vocabulary and language for these um, processes. And um, in other words, like what are the ways that we could animate what I think are often very, very bloodless categories or principles of analysis that we can name and list. And, um, but then when it comes to actually doing the writing, communicating what it means, we sort of um, uh, have a hard time getting at um, really showing what the meaning is at a, at a practical level, by which I mean at the level of practice and process. And so, I mean, at the most general level, that's a lot of what I've been trying to do methodologically. That's partially how Asha asked the question about method. Um, and so there have been, you know, for very, for specific projects, um, particular kinds of feminist or Marxist um, sometimes anti-racist orthodoxies that, you know, provoke you to say something to find a better way to express what the point is, um, but also then to, um, um, and those, those I think are important, but I also, um, my, my own mode is been to try to find, um, friendly thinkers, I would say. I mean, people who I can learn from and with rather than just focus on the ones that I'm in an antagonistic relationship to. This is, I think, also what it means to be kind of indifferent or to be in a position of refusal, um, that you have to focus your intellectual energy too on what you want and not just what you hate. And I mean, scholars are taught to do that in a particular way, to, to do critique in that in that sense. So what happens if you ask of the critique that it needs to do something um, something else? And so that's, that's what I've been trying to do and what it's meant methodologically is to try to really focus on trying to find a mode of, of writing um, that uh, I feel can um, take on this really very, very difficult job of um, not just saying that um, you know intersectionality matters, but um, to really showing what it means to replace simple linear understandings of determination of subjectivity of social action with more complex ones and also more relational ones. You know, so when you know Avtar described you know earlier and in her interview as um, how do you understand intersectionality as intersecting power regimes? Like to understand that the world is intersectional. It's not just something in us. All that is much easier to, to announce or pronounce than it is to, to really do a kind of rich analysis that gets you there. Um, that's also if at the same time you're trying to to understand that part of what the world is, is bound up with the struggle against the way things are organized. You're always holding those things together. So that's, I don't know if that creates a method, but that creates <laughs> um, uh, 
a need to be working. So that's, yeah. And yeah, whether that's the right kind of feminism, what kind of feminism is, is, I don't know exactly what to call it, but abolition feminism is okay. I'm okay with that, with that, I guess. So that's it. <laughs> I think that's a method. Uh, Brenna and Ruth, did you want to add anything? I guess I just briefly wanted to add one of the things that comes through clearly in all of the interviews um, is people might use the word intersectionality quite often, but the methods here that we are speaking about um, that people in, in attendance are talking about are actually very deep historical and sociological ways of thinking of intersectionality. It's not simply saying um, race and class and gender matter and we add them together and we end up with this thing or um, in an article quickly saying, but of course race also matters to my argument. I just don't have enough space to talk about it. It's actually um, a much deeper methodology um, like Avtar and Avery were speaking about that historicizes how these relations are co-constitutive um, and also how they operate on a global scale. So a, a lot of the writing on intersectionality tends to be extremely localized um, and ignores the larger picture of colonial relations and empires and how much they shape the present um, and how much modes of extraction also shape the present. So I think when you read through the interviews, um, uh, there's, there, I find there's two binaries sometimes in the discussion on intersectionality, either an absolute dismissal of it as, oh, this is liberal, even Hillary Clinton loves it, or um, as this is the all and be all. But I think there's, there's modes of analysis that are much deeper around race, class, and gender, um, and anti-heteronormativity that are very productive. And within the book, we sort of explore how each thinker thinks of it differently from their own angle, um, which is quite unique and quite different. And, and that's where like the personal story and the personal history also really matter to the method that ends up getting developed. Um, I think, Asha, part of your question also related to how the different methodologies developed by uh, Avtar, Avery, and Leanne um, might uh, relate to uh, you mentioned at the beginning a broadly sort of legal, feminist legal audience. <laughs> and um, I, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. I think two, two things come to my mind. One is um, thinking about how much of what has been discussed um, either intersects with or falls within a very broad understanding of what constitutes the juridical and um, you know I think that as as lawyers or legal academics um, you know it, it it is I think very much a work in progress when it comes to uh, uh, critical race uh, feminist you know legal studies let's say um, um, in terms of expanding and challenging the boundaries of how we conceive of what the law is and how we conceive of, you know, what constitutes the juridical form if we, if we want to adapt that, that idea of legality. Um, and, and then I think something, I guess, um, maybe much less abstract has to do with the the position of legal educators at this particular moment. So, so some of the things that I, I outlined at the beginning and that we've been discussing about the current conjuncture, I did see something quite interesting on this law and political economy blog, which was a statement by uh, law professors in the US who teach criminal law. And it was a statement they had written about their responsibility as, uh, as, as law professors in particular, when it comes to um, issues of uh, the carceral and, and incarceration um, a, as a way of addressing, you know, the, the global movement for black lives and, uh, um, you know, the, the massive uh, 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 rates of incarceration of racialized uh, people in the U.S. That, that it's incumbent upon them to really consider how they teach that particular subject. 
you know, and, and to think about how they, their role in training future lawyers uh, into having, I think what is very often times, uh, you know, naturalized as a kind of carceral mentality. Um, and, and we've seen, I, I think, well, I'm just starting to find out, you know, all of these uh, changes in, in uh, Canadian law faculties around how, how a number of different, um, you know, aspects of the legal discipline are taught and conceived of uh, now as a, uh, as a part of a, a process of decolonization, or at least let's, that, that's what we hope is, is uh, this is a part of. So, so I think um, when I think about the contents of this book and then legal studies or feminist legal studies, I think that there, it's a, you know, the, there's a lot in it that for me is a really rich resource that can be taken into uh, some of the questions that might preoccupy people working within the specific field of law. Thank you. That helps me too. <laughs> um, so let me ask our final question as time ticks along. Um, and I, I couldn't let you leave without asking you about that pillar of revolutionary feminisms, solidarity and activism. Some of you have uh, spoken about this already. Um, so I will, I'll just sort of situate my question and then turn it back over to you. All of you were formed in different contexts of activism in contexts where solidarity and coming together made a difference, whether Indian independence or indigenous protests or union organizing and collective action. And you've all furthered the various causes of revolutionary feminism through solidarity and protest. And so I've pointed out some examples, I'll just quickly point out um, a few others. After you were a founding member of South Hall Black Sisters, Leanne, you are part of the Dechinta Center, Avery, you're the radio host of No Alibi and the keeper of the Hawthorne Archives. Each of you will have more to say about your work on the ground, uh, the importance of keeping the record and the challenges of building solidarity. But what I wanted to ask you about in, in the context of speaking about those things is the conditions under which this kind of revolutionary struggle, radical thought and praxis can emerge and take hold. And so Angela Davis, who's also a contributor to this book, recently said um, in a Vanity Fair article, this moment is a conjuncture between the COVID-19 crisis and the increasing awareness of the structural nature of racism. Moments like this do arise, they're totally unpredictable, and we cannot base our organizing on the idea that we can usher in such a moment. What we can do is to take advantage of the moment. So I wanted to end by asking you about the opportunities and challenges right now for facilitating, as Avtar would say, the emergence of a common shared project. Um, so Leah, maybe we can start with you this time. Sure. Um, I think that one of the things that I've been working on as part of my work at the Dechinta Center for Research and Learning in the North in Yellowknife's Dene territory is looking at uh, land-based solidarity because I think land for us is both something that um, is shared and can be a, a source of tremendous solidarity and it's also one of the things that can be a sticking point particularly if it's conceptualized within uh, the nation state um, or, and how it's conceptualized within capitalism as a as a resource as something that is owned as something that is that's protected um, as something that's uh, a resource to to extract and to exploit and so undoing this idea of land and undoing this idea of place as an act of solidarity and in cohort with with black thinkers and um, activists of color and doing it actually on the land is something that um, we started that work before before the, the global pandemic um, by inviting uh, folks up to that area and spending time with them in Dene territory on the land in uh, in the middle of winter and what we found was that sharing food caribou ribs and muskox ribs sitting around the fire uh, snowmobiling out to this site sharing fish um, 
having a conversation, developing a relationality outside of Twitter, outside of institutions, outside of conferences, um, enabled us to ask a different set of questions and we had different conversations. And so our intent uh, was to continue, continue that work. And of course, <laughs> we're now only allowed to Zoom. Um, so one of the things that one of the participants and I did, Robin Maynard, who is the author of Policing Black Matters and who is one of the activists and organizers of Black Lives Matters Toronto, we really wanted to continue on that work. We had plans of, of because we live fairly close to each other. We had plans of making maple syrup together in, in Anishinaabe Sugarbush. We had plans of walking the streets of Toronto, walking Bay Street um, together with our children um, and, and seeing where that got us. And, and then we were all in lockdown. So we went to, to sort of that feminist tradition of letter writing, that black feminist tradition of letter writing. And over the course of the last six months, we attempted to deepen our relationship to each other by writing these dorky academic <laughs> letters to each other. And it's become this really, really beautiful project for me. It, it's become one of those things during COVID that um, I looked forward to and that um, I think helped me cope. We were able to think together through um, our government's, the state's response to the pandemic in terms of anti-blackness and in terms of, it, of colonialism and indigenous people. We were able to read things together and, and that all started from the simple act of, of just being on the land together. And so I'm interested in this idea of, of solidarity as a practice, solidarity as relationships. The land is something that I think helps uh, me. It, it places the, the thing that can unite us and also the thing that can um, divide us right at the center. And it forces us to develop language and develop thinking around, around sharing and generosity. And, and I think that that's been, um, that's been a really, really beautiful part of, of this ongoing never ending crisis. Aptar, shall I go next? Is that okay? Or are you? Yeah, that's fine. You go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. So um, this, uh, to me, this question is important because it, it brings us back around to where Brenna started um, and um, where she was, in effect, trying to lay out a little bit of what she sees as the current conjuncture. And um, I just want to say, first of all, that... Um, I um, I credit Stuart Hall with the call to understand the current conjuncture. And when he made that call, either in writing or to you personally, he was asking for something difficult because he was asking for us to try to understand the specificity of a given present moment. You know, its coordinates, if you like, on a kind of socioeconomic, geopolitical map, how that that present moment emerged historically, what its tendencies are, where it might drift or be pushed, and what its political possibilities and its threats are. And so he was asking for, I think this call to understand the conjuncture is a, a, for a level of analytic precision, historical awareness, and also, I don't know, for lack of a better phrase, like intuitive political fortune telling, but I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, that's very, very difficult to achieve. And I think that it's become more difficult to do conjunctural analysis with a media and a social media, both Brenna and Leanne mentioned this in, in their own ways, that first of all creates ma major crises every week and then makes them obsolescent um, just as quickly. And so in that context, it's also very difficult to create a shared revolutionary or transformative project in this kind of how temporality. I mean, a revolution. so much noise and distraction, which I think is feeding unhealthy diet of digestible bits of information and slogans that really have little staying power um, if your attention and, and 
in mood is primed to move kind of urgently from one now to to another so maybe it's just my age but i think there's some other kind of temporality and embodiment that's required for the sort of long slower work of preparing or getting ready to take advantage of any of these political crises and or uprisings or upsurges from below the situation or the moment that Angela's referring to in terms of COVID and, and Brenda you started with it COVID and the um, Black Lives Matters uprisings I see these as part of a, a longer cycle of worldwide resistance to to neoliberalism or to what um, Marcos called the the fourth world war against humanity this cycle I think really started in the 1990s the Zapatista uprising fourth world um, uh, uprising um, cr crucial flashpoints here that I think have continued I mean we can argue over the the periodization and there's clearly a longer a longer fetch here but what we've seen over this period of time is that many many people um, some longer than others have been trying at various scales to in whatever way they can to battle the various fronts in this war. So there's a lot of ferment from, from below, some of it organized and experienced, some of it not, but none of it is yet coordinated into a common or a shared project in the way that I, I think Avtar means by that. And so what are the challenges to getting there? And I think there are several big ones to organizing this ferment, and I just, I'm gonna mention a, a couple of them. Um, but vis-a-vis -vis the United States, I just speak about the United States. This one is maybe broader. And the first challenge to me is, well, just what is the common or shared project? I mean, is it avoiding ecological destruction, abolishing the police, abolishing racial capitalism, wage slavery, Western forms of knowing and being? Is it all of these? Um, is Would abolition create the conditions for a peaceful, equitable, just, and caring society, are these even the right, the right terms? And I put it this way is because the more general the common project is described, the greater distance it has from the really gnarly world of political struggle, where goals have to be, you know, operationalized, and then where the question of what they really mean and how to achieve them then become points of grave contention, if not sectarianism. So we're in a particular moment now where we're going to have to think about that again. Um, the second challenge, I think, is that the social movement models that we've been using um, don't work so well anymore. I mean, to make the changes people demand and the capitalist democratic state, in my view, is just weakened to the point of incapacity. You know, so particularly in the United States, um, the country has dealt with a set of recurring crises in its own economic fragility and indebtedness since the early 1970s by redistributing vast um, resources, financial and otherwise, to, as you mentioned, Brenna, parasitic private corporations and to the armed forces whether these are the conventional military, the border police, or the various state and city police forces, this is an unstable and destructive situation on the one hand. On the other, it's produced greater awareness, how deep we'll see that the capitalist democratic state as it exists cannot deliver the solutions to the problems that it creates. So one of the things that's, I think, really debates and struggles over whether to abolish or reform policing, um, which seem maybe a specific question. Nonetheless, I think this is a very telling and living laboratory for a set of really complex problems of political strategy, desirable forms of governance or decision making, what notions of autonomy really mean, and importantly, scale. And if I could just mention, can I have one more minute? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Asha, is it okay? Um, the, um, I mean, I think the third challenge here is that 
there is a large armed force arrayed against us. <laughs> this has been, in effect, the state's response to the demands made on it. I mean, the United States is a police state. Just definition, on definitional terms, I could argue that it is. What's important for me about that here is that this repressive force cannot be defeated by the usual repertoire of nonviolent protest techniques, however creative they are, and I say this as someone very involved in them, this force I think can only be defeated once it's internally weakened, and that means mutiny, desertion, and the shifting of loyalty and obedience um, from within those places, and they have their own logic of organization, their own affects, and their own culture. And really, with the exception of a very small number of veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and their behavior at Standing Rock is pretty exemplary, I think, we're talking about more, this is on nobody's agenda. And I think it's to our discredit and it has significant consequences. I mean, the last thing to say about the United States is that it is a profoundly nationalist country and even among radicals, internationalism is a minority position. Um, and that has, that's a challenge for any project that's gonna address the global nature of capitalism, of militarism in the, in the environment. And that is gonna, you know, deal with all kinds of things, including the problem of scale that's posed to what are our very creative, resilient, and inspiring alternatives that we can make in our own spaces. So, I mean, I, this sounds bleak, I'm not hopeless. I am absolutely believe <laughs> it's social struggles and being in the fight, but I think there are very big challenges and there's a lot of work ahead, um, publicly and individually, to actually build the world that we want and we need. And I do not think it can happen without facing a bit more square on this, these kinds of challenges. And that's what I meant before about practice, you know, like the ideas and then really how they, how you can make them work. So this is, this is our biggest challenge is how we understand where we are and how we're going to get somewhere else. So, yeah, thanks. Okay. Avatar, you can go ahead. Okay, all right. Yes, well, um, you've thrown us a big challenge, Avery. Uh, you're absolutely right. The, the, the sorts of questions that we are discussing and raising, um, they are actually daunting at one level. But at the same time, um, one works at different levels, as you can, I'm sure you would agree. There are certain things that can happen through solidarity, interconnections, political alliances at a global scale. But there are others which are much more kind of, you know, possible, we can all get engaged in, that happen much more at a local level, at a, at a, at a manageable level. And I, I think that the sorts of politics that I'm kind of really um, committed to uh, are sort of to work towards a nonviolent world, for instance, you know, and to work against authoritarian politics. I'm sure we'll all agree around those. I mean, those are rife. Um, so to organize against questions of authoritarianism, to organize against militarism, and to work for peace in the world, they seem at one level unsurmountable. But on the other hand, I think when we work on small scale, then we work in solidarity with others. I think that there is hope that we can actually push towards uh, a vision that is more sort of, you know, uh, amenable to everyone's life worlds. I agree that these things are not going to be easy. And you're right, but the, the sort of things that we have seen, the, the positive 
issues that have uh, come onto the political agenda recently, like when George Floyd was killed and, and the ways in which everyone kind of responded to that, not just in the US, but here in Britain, in Europe, in Global South, those, that kind of uh, interconnection that we feel as human beings, I think they're small things, but they are important. Um, I think there is now growing recognition that racism is not only interpersonal, though it is very much interpersonal too, but that it is structural. And that recognition and means that we can construct a politics which can address that. For instance, then the Occupy uh, movement, for example, um, movements like that for social and economic equality across the globe, I think make us realize, and then of course the um, in, in, in Britain, we've had, no, not just Britain, but globally, we've had uh, um, the, Extin the Extinction Rebellion, again, a global environmental movement. I think these are sort of hopeful signs. I agree with you totally, Avery, that they are, um, we, we would be amiss if we just saw this is going to solve the problem at one go. It won't. It will be small scale chipping away over a very long period of time, including by generations to come. It won't just be just our generation or one generation here, but it's also future. But I like to feel positive, not like to feel, but I do feel positive that despite the problems that we are facing, that there are also signs of hope. Uh, signs that we can actually have a different world. I think I'll stop there. It's hard to uh, close on, on that note, but we are at time. And so I'll just say, Brenna and Rafif, we do have a few moments if you wanted to add any thoughts um, before I sign us off. Um. Hmm. Leanne, did you have any last comments or, no? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, my head is kind of swimming <laughs> uh, after this discussion uh, because so many different and very rich um, ideas and ways of thinking have been uh, uh, discussed and brought up. And um, I, I think that one thing that struck me about Avery's uh, comments about the conjunctural analysis that I was invoking and Hall's idea um, is that it's interesting in thinking about what that kind of analysis of this moment demands. It does seem entirely at odds it, it, with the kind of discourse, whether it's anti-racist or anti-capitalist or uh, you know, the discourse around climate change that we see happening in the media and also the academic, uh, the loop between academia and the media and social media, etc. cetera. Um, and that kind of slower, um, you know, kind of work that that sort of analysis demands is, is at odds with, with our, our current academic environment, let's say, or even um, many activist environments, wh which are also uh, uh, focused very much on, on immediate, on immediate. But I guess um, that at the same time, it feels like that's exactly the kind of analysis that we need. <laughs> so uh, in terms of the, the uh, contemporary, you know, forms of, indigenous feminism, black feminisms, and, and other uh, revolutionary feminisms that are seeking to kind of seize back time from this machine. Um, I think that, you know, it, 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 it I guess it's, for me, it focuses my mind that seizing back that time and creating a different sort of temporality for our work and for the kinds of things we do together um, is really a, a, a top priority. 
I just wanted to jump in briefly and say um, there was one excellent question by Professor Nahla Abdu, but I'm not sure if she's still around, um, around why there's no Palestinian feminist um, within the book. And I just wanted to acknowledge um, that this is something we say right in the introduction, that the book would have been a lot richer. Uh, it's not just Palestinian feminists, but also African feminists, Latin American feminists. Um, we couldn't include everything in one book, but also it just had to do with practicalities around travel and having no funding for travel as UK academia gets cut to the bone. Um, so. I was thinking of it in terms of volume one, volume two, and having various conversations. So that's something we're very much aware of in the book and that hopefully other people also want to take on projects like this and interview even more people. Um, like I started off saying, I think it's a very productive um, way of actually having conversations to try and structure them as interviews um, and build them in a conversational collaborative way. And thanks everyone for attending. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Well, let me um, thank all of you formally for joining us today. Uh, and I think I speak for everybody out there and I think we had about 100 people. Uh, I think we've all learned a lot. Uh, there's much more to say about history and memory and haunting and tying that to this present moment. Um, but we don't have time now. So maybe next time or maybe in volume two, Rafif. <laughs> Um, so if you will join me in thanking the panelists, um, the editors, and all of the co-sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Asha and Deborah again. Now, I don't know how to turn this off, so we're just going to see what happens. <laughs> I, I I'm going to leave. That's how I'm going to turn it off. Okay. Thank you all. It was very nice to chat with all of you. And yes, same yeah. to you all. Yes. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>